Who among us would not like to be rich today? My favorite musical, perhaps, of all time is Fiddler on the Roof. And secretly, I think we all may well identify with Tevier in his complaining prayer. Dear God, why have you made so many, many poor people? I realize, of course, it's no shame to be poor, but it's no great honor either. So what would have been so terrible if I had a small fortune? And then Tevier sings his famous song, If I Were a Rich Man. And the lyric begins with his reminder to God that if uh, he were a rich man, he wouldn't have to work hard. All day long, he just deedle deedle dum, biddy biddy dum. <laughs> and in the middle of the song, <clears throat> Tevia sings, I'd build a big, tall house with rooms by the dozen. Right in the middle of the town, there'd be one long staircase going up and a longer one coming down and one leading nowhere just for show. The present age in which we live is being dubbed in history as the age of greed. Yuppies, Rolex watches, Avia sneakers, Charles Keating, Trump shuttle. In a recent survey, 89% agreed that our society in America today is too materialistic. 74% said materialism is a very serious social problem. The ambition and indeed the determination of many couples to make for a better material standard of living requiring both persons to be in the workplace is having a corrosive effect of materialism on our families. 90% of those surveyed agreed that children today want far more material things than is good for them to have. In the kingdom of earth, it appears that businesses are primarily devoted and dedicated toward making profits and too little dedicated toward offering services. Our wants are spending out of control. In the same survey, 71% agreed that being greedy is actually a sin against God. And I wonder if greed isn't at the root of all our sin. At the same time, 84% of those surveyed said they wish they had more money than they presently have. With our multi-trillion dollar debt in this land, you would think we'd be able to see that our greedy materialism is leading us into bankruptcy. Too many of us are like little children. What we want, we want right now, and we don't want to have to wait to get it. Even Christians seem more bent in laying up treasures on earth that last for no more than 80 or 90 years and then are valueless rather than heeding Jesus' counsel Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where those treasures only keep growing in value. The Apostle Paul taught, loving money leads to all kinds of evil, and many in their struggle for more money have lost their souls and caused themselves untold agonies of mind. You see, folks, the poor, every bit as much as the rich, may covet money. Does not greed give rise to most of yours and my sins? Who is rich among us, really? Richness is something that's very relative. The Lamar Hunts, compared with the Waltons, are poor. Compared with the Hunts, you and I are poor. The only person on the face of the earth I've ever heard admit out loud of being rich is my wife. <laughs> the poorest among us here today are rich, even in this world's goods compared with at least 92% of all of our world neighbors. Even those living on Social Security today in this land are rich compared with the vast majority of our world neighbors. Jesus told a short story that our age needs to hear even more than the first century age needed to hear it. There was a hard-working farmer who had great crops. 
His storage bins were full, and he had no room left for storage. He decided he'd tear down his smaller storage barns and build bigger ones. And then he thought to himself, Saul, you have goods to last you for many years to come. Why don't you relax, eat, drink, and be merry? When this man had enough to be the envy of his neighbors, even his country club neighbors, and enough to be proud of his own ingenuity and his savings, God said to him a very surprising thing. You fool! You fool this night! This night you will die. Your soul will be taken from you, and the things which you've been storing up for yourself, whose will they be then? As usual, Jesus concluded this parable with a, a punch moral line. So it is with those who store up treasure for themselves on earth, but are not rich toward God. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with this honest, hard-working man being rich. He got his money the old-fashioned way. He earned it. Why should he not prosper? Why shouldn't such a man prosper? Now, there's nothing wrong with having lots of things, and there's nothing wrong at all with one's carefully planning for those retirement years. The possession of money, folks, isn't bad, but it's dangerous. It can be impossible. It can be impossible for the rich to get into the kingdom if they're money has possessed them rather than them having possessed their money. When one has all that he or she actually needs, that person can get very set on self. Notice the possessive pronouns this man in Jesus' short story used. Let me quote him. What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger barns, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. You've got plenty. Here are 12 aggressive pronouns in that little two-sentence monologue he had with himself. It was as if he was a self-made person with no appreciation for God's seed, soil, sun, rain, and hungry market to buy his produce. Now, it was said of a self-centered young man, John lived in a little world, bounded on the south and the north, the east and the west, by John. Now, there's a strange thing about getting more income. The more you have, the more you have to worry about keeping it. And the more we get, the more we automatically increase our standard of living, and the more and more we need in return. And getting more is still not quite enough to satisfy. Someone one time asked one of the richest of the Rockefellers, how much must you have to have enough? And Rockefeller answered, just a little bit more. Now, the more we gain, having more soon proves to be inadequate. What we all need, what every one of us needs most deeply in this life, can never be satisfied, folks, with fatter salaries or more property holdings. The man in Jesus' story concentrated his energies upon making more. His confidence was not in God, who's the giver of every good and perfect thing, he imagined that he could assure his own security and control his future by his careful planning. But God called him a fool. Now, the problem with having more than we actually need is that it tends to foster an illusion of self-sufficiency that can blind us to our ever-present need for God. God alone is our ultimate security, not our temporary financial securities. And this hunger for more and more is hazardous to our soul, not because things or having things is evil, 
but because the zealous quest to accumulate more saps the time and the energy we need to be living for God a bit. Many are rich in themselves, but literally poverty-stricken before God. The effort to get more than we need only results in a life of less than we need. The effort to get more than we need results in a, less, a life with less than we need. There's another thing about the rich farmer with which I think most of us can identify. We have a tendency to make all of our plans on the basis of our present life. I sometimes worry about living beyond 88 because our financial planner tells me our capital will be exhausted by that time. 25 years ago, the American Council on Education asked thousands of students what was their motivation for seeking a higher education. And 83% answered that it was crucial for them in developing a, a philosophy of life. Five years ago, the same question was put to thousands of students, and 75% said they wanted to get a college education so that they could have better jobs and a better income and a higher standard of living. So many among us, in a community like ours particularly, are well to do unto themselves, and yet they're anything but rich unto God. One time, a young fellow asked Jesus, Teacher, what good deed must I do to be absolutely sure of eternal life? And Jesus mentioned the commandments, and he said, I've kept all of those. And then Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this word, he walked away deeply grieved because he had so many possessions. Now, folks, please understand that Jesus did not mean, Jesus did not mean that we should quench our passion for more by becoming so materially impoverished that we have nothing to go on, live on in this world. He is saying that we should quit hanging on so tightly to these things that tend to possess us. And sometimes, sometimes that does mean literally giving up desire for some of the things we want very much in order that we may give away property and money to meet the physical and the spiritual needs of others. We must do this to break the hold that these things tend to have on us and to dissipate the illusion that our, the quality of our life depends upon the abundance of our possessions. We are not what we own. The only thing that matters in the end, the only thing that matters in the end is how we are before God. It is only as we follow Christ, pour out our creative energies, precious time, and financial resources for Christ's sake, that we become rich overnight toward God. Our money and possessions pass out of our limp, expired hands sooner or late, and God is the only source of our security, the only source of our satisfaction, and the only source of our salvation. The question Jesus puts to every one of us in this parable is not whether we're good or bad, but are we fools? Fools squandering eternity for a bit of pocket cash, pocket change of pleasure now. Folks, every cent you and I have is on a lend-lease plan, and the lease runs on until God says, today is your soul required of you. You can't take one cent of your hard-earned treasures with you, but you can send it on ahead. It's the treasure that we lay up in heaven today that makes us rich unto God for keeps. Now, I think all of us need to recheck our checkbook stubs and our investment receipts to see if possibly we're a fool in the eyes of God. Are we more concerned about being practical than we are concerned about being righteous? Are we losing our life in that mad effort to make a livelihood? Are we more anxious to bring home the bacon than we are to bring home the stars? 
Jesus said that where your interests and your investments are, that's going to be the center where your heart is also. It's only when we're seeking first God and God's ways here and now on earth that we are rich unto God for always. When we invest in God's kingdom here on earth, when we invest in God's kingdom here on earth, that's where our heart and soul will be. When we fix our heart on Jesus Christ, we are rich at once, rich unto eternal life. In a Charlie Brown comic strip, Lucy and her brother Linus have uh, just finished a chicken dinner, and Lucy is explaining to Linus how wishing with a wishbone works. She says we, make, we both make our wishes, and then we pull it apart, and the one who gets the larger piece gets his or her wishes. And Linus asks, do you have to wish out loud? And Lucy says, of course, if you don't ask out loud, if you don't wish out loud, the wish answer isn't going to know what to bring you. And Lucy begins wishing. Let's see, she says, I, I wish for a new doll, uh, a new bicycle, four new sweaters, some uh, new shoes, a wristwatch, and, and about $400. And then Linus gets his turn. I wish for a long life for my friends. I wish for peace on the earth. I wish for great advancement in science and medicine. And Lucy throws the wishbone down saying, you seem to have a knack of spoiling everything. <laughs> what do we wish for? To be well off for a relatively short time on earth or to be rich unto God forever? So many are relatively rich in this world's goods here and now, but are absolutely poverty-stricken before God. God bless the generous souls among us who pour out their lives without measuring, without counting the cost. They give more than they have to, and they take less than they deserve. They don't give to God out of their leftovers and their surplus, but goods and money they could well have used for themselves. They provide for family and friends and good causes and church in their wills, but also generously give while they live here and now. Thank God he has loved us, and he sent one to give us this parable and to give himself to save you and me from being a fool. Remember the words of Scripture. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, rich with all of heaven, yet for your sakes, for your sakes, he became poor, so that through his poverty, you might be rich unto eternal life. Amen.